Well, good evening. Uh, get to join you tonight. Uh, my name is Tyler. For those of you who maybe don't know, I'm Pastor Fulcher and uh, Miss Phyllis's son. Uh, and so it's great to get to interact with you, uh, you all. Uh, so uh, my wife and I and our two girls uh, are here uh, in Butler and we are having a little bit of time with our family uh, and it's been, been a great time to just sort of get away and to be with them. And my dad asked if I would share tonight uh, with you all from, from God's Word uh, as we look at it. Uh, so let's just open up with prayer and uh, begin to then to look into, uh, into God's Word and see what uh, he has to say to us tonight. So let's pray. Uh, God, I thank you for the opportunity to be together. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to use technology uh, to study your word together and to grow in our faithfulness to you. I pray that you would help us uh, to be more like you every single day and be more like you in our interactions in real life and more like you in our interactions, um, our interactions online. And thank you for that, Lord. I pray specifically for Butler First. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would bring peace uh, and health to this church, Lord, so that they can once again meet together, uh, Lord, and to worship you uh, physically in the same room together. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, be on the lookout from Pastor Fulcher and them so with an update about uh, when services will be back in person. Uh, you'll be getting uh, information about that in the coming days. Uh, so make sure that you stay tuned to that. Uh, obviously, it's a, it's a crazy time in our country. It's a crazy, crazy day. Um, and uh, I'm not going to get into that very much. Instead, actually, what I want to do is focus on uh, what it looks like for us to be faithful to God. Okay, uh, And if we are faithful to God, then that will trickle out into all areas of our life where we will be faithful to God in the way that we interact uh, in our community, the way that we interact in our country, and the way we interact with those all around the world. Uh, and one of the best ways to, to think about uh, acting faithfully to God is to look to God's Word for examples of what it looks like to be faithful to God. And I, I think that uh, there is a very important set of passages that can help us think through this issue. Uh, and they're from the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament, and so it should be no surprise that that's where I go. Uh, so if you're with me, you can turn in your Bible, or you can pull it up on your phone, uh, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's where we'll start first tonight. So to get sort of some lay of the land, Deuteronomy is one of the first five books of the Bible. It's the fifth book. It's in the thing called the Pentateuch. It's the story of Israel from creation through to God calling Abraham to making uh, one nation and then leading them right up to the edge of the promised land, the land of Canaan. So uh, Deuteronomy is basically one big sermon and repeating of the law of God uh, for uh, his people. So uh, Deuteronomy is a wonderful book. It lays out sort of everything that the law is supposed to be, and it encourages them to uh, make sure that they are following and obeying the law. So let's read just a little bit in Deuteronomy chapter 6. It's a famous passage, uh, and so let's read it. It says, starting in verse 1, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me, so this is Moses speaking, to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding you, so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently, so that it may go well with you, and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, has promised you. And then this is some of the famous verses, starting in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children, and talk about them when you are at home, and when you are away, and when you lie down, and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead, and write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. 
When the Lord your God has brought you into the land that he swore to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you a land with fine, large cities that you did not build, houses filled with all sorts of goods that you did not fill, hewn cisterns that you did not hoe, vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. And when you have eaten your fill, take care that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. The Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name alone you shall swear. Do not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who are all around you, because the Lord your God who is present with you is a jealous God. The anger of the Lord your God would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you from the face of the earth. Okay, so it's quite uh, quite an interesting passage there. Uh, what it's saying is that you're going to get into this promised land, and it's going to be amazing, and you're going to be blessed, and in fact, you're going to have blessings that you didn't work for. Don't be tempted in that moment to forget the God that you serve. So uh, we can think about this in our own lives, that when we are blessed by God, uh, that is sometimes the easiest opportunity for us to fall away from God. When we are experiencing blessings that maybe we didn't work for, suddenly we become prideful and we think that we've sort of, we're like hot stuff and that we, uh, we deserved what we got or we did something to accomplish it. And God is warning them that this is going to happen. You're going to be blessed with this wonderful land, uh, but make sure that you don't forget the Lord. And the way that you make sure you don't forget God is by spending all of this time studying his word, putting it into practice. I mean, he says to bind it on their forehead, to write it on their hands, to write it on their doorpost. I mean, think about, you know, when you were in high school or in junior high or something and you were in love with someone and you just wrote their name a million times in the notebook, right? This is the type of infatuation that God wants us to have for his word, right? So that when we're uh, busy throughout our day, when we just stop and we think about something instead of like uh you know doodling instead what we do is we just write out a memory verse we write out something from the bible and we begin to think about god's word both day and night and those are the things that help us grow in our relationship with god and actually be more faithful to god so we're thinking about this question of what does it look like in our daily lives to be more faithful to god the number one way that we do that is we take all of our extra time and we become, we fall in love with God's word. We fall in love with what he says and we study it and we learn it so that we can be more faithful to him. Okay, we're going to fast forward in Deuteronomy all the way to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Okay, so again, Deuteronomy is sort of this overarching story that's retelling the law to the people and it's explaining what God wants you to do. And so it comes to this moment in Deuteronomy 17, verse 14 through 20, that it's going to talk about what the king will be like. Now remember, uh, God was supposed to be the people's king, but he knew that they eventually would ask for their own king to be like the rest of the nations, and God would allow them to have that. And so this is the example that God wants the king to live up to. Deuteronomy 17, starting in verse 14. When you have come into the land that the Lord your God has given you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me, you may indeed set over you a king whom the Lord your God will choose. One of your own community you may set as king over you. You are not permitted to put a foreigner over you who is not of your own community. Even so, he must not acquire many horses for himself or return the people to Egypt in order to acquire more horses since the Lord has said to you, you must never return that way again. And he must not acquire from many wives for himself, or else his heart will turn away. Also silver and gold he must not acquire in great quantity for himself. When he has taken the throne of his kingdom, he shall have a copy of this law written for him in the presence of the Levitical priests. It shall remain with him, and he shall read in it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to fear the Lord his God diligently, observing all the words of this law, and these statutes, neither exalting himself above other members of the community, nor turning aside from the commandment, either to the right or to the left, so that he and his descendants may reign long over his kingdom in Israel. So this is uh, God's command for the king. And he laid out some very specific things that Israel's king should do. He should not acquire horses from Egypt. Okay, horses are 
uh, military strength. And so you're not supposed to build up the military for Israel. They're supposed to trust God. I mean, these are the people who, in the next book, Joshua, and then in Judges, would see God perform many miracles, that they would win these battles that they had no business winning. I'm thinking of Gideon, who beats an entire army with just 300 people, right? And so to build up your military for Israelites was to not trust in the Lord's provision. So this is what he says, don't go back to Egypt to get things. Don't ever do that. Don't acquire many wives. Don't build up a lot of silver and gold. And make sure when you take over the law, what's the first thing the king should do? He should have the law written for him when he becomes king. The very first thing you should do is focus on God's word. Okay. All right. So that is Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 17. It's two really interesting passages about what God wants his people to do. And when we think about what it looks like for us to be faithful... It's very clear from Deuteronomy and from throughout Scripture that in order for us to be faithful, we need to be always in God's Word. We need to spend all the time that we can studying and getting to know God's Word so that our lives can match up to it. Okay, now we're going to fast forward again. This time we're going to fast forward to another book called 1st and 2nd Kings. Okay, and we're going to think about all that happens in between. So Deuteronomy is sort of Moses' last sermon It's the recording of the law. Joshua is the story of Israel coming into the land of of Canaan and how they defeat all of the enemies there and then they actually win over the land. And then Judges is this very sad story about how things continually get worse as the people are unfaithful. And then we arrive in 1st and 2nd Samuel and we meet the first king, Saul. Yeah, he's unfaithful. We meet David. And David is this famous king who's known for being a man after God's own heart. But when you read his story, it's actually quite sad and troubled. Uh, He is always repentant to God, which wins him favor with the Lord, to be sure. Uh, But he is by no means a saint in the way that we would think of it. And then we arrive in 1 Kings. Now, 1 Kings 1 through 11 is often sort of known as this amazing story about how awesome Solomon is. So, so Solomon is the third king in Israel's history. And, and he is amazing in many respects. He becomes known as the wisest man who ever lived. Uh, at one point, he becomes the wealthiest man who's ever lived. So think Bill Gates, but richer, right? Or whoever else happens to be, I guess, Jeff, Jeff Bezos, right? But richer. Uh, and this is supposed to be Solomon. And Solomon is awesome. And there's wonderful stories there. But when you go back and you read 1 Kings 1 through 11, after having just read parts of Deuteronomy, you'll begin to see that there are major problems all along the way. And I just wanted to point out a few of those to you. First off, in 1 Kings 1 through 2, David is an old man and he's dying. And he's supposed to be this faithful Israelite king. And yet his last commands to Saul to Solomon are, hey, don't let these people die in peace, right? So basically, take out my vengeance on them, which is not something that you would want your dad to say to you, much less the most faithful king in Israel's history. So then we arrive at 1 Kings 3, verse 1, and I'm just going to read different verses throughout these first sections of the book and sort of show you how even as the story is showing us how great Solomon is, it's laying a foundation for some major problems. So the end of chapter 2 says, So the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So he becomes king. And now what's the first thing that Solomon should do? If you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17, the first thing he should do is he should have the law written for him. It's the first thing he should do. Instead, what we find in chapter 3, verse 1, Solomon made a marriage alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Ooh, well, that's not good. So the very first thing he does as a king is the exact opposite of what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to write the law in which he would realize that when he wrote the law, he was not supposed to have many wives. He was not supposed to go back to Egypt, right? But because he doesn't write the law, and because that's not the first thing that he does, The very first thing he does do is he marries someone from Egypt and he builds an alliance with them. So that is a major, major problem. In verse 3 it says, Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. 
So even when Solomon was doing so many things right, he made major mistakes in the way that he was living for the Lord because he messed up the very first thing he was supposed to do, which was spend time learning and studying God's word. That was supposed to be his first and only objective in life was to know God's word so that he could live rightly and faithfully himself and so that he could lead the nation to do the same. And then we turn to chapter 6. So if you fast forward a few chapters, chapter 6, verses 11 through 13, it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon, concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes, obey my ordinances, and keep all my commandments by walking in them, then I will establish my promise with you, which I made to your father David, and will dwell among you, among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. So even as Solomon is making these promises, making these uh, mistakes, God is still there promising to be faithful to him if only he will follow the statutes and ordinances, if only he will follow the law. But we know, as people who are paying attention, reading this book, that this is the one thing that Solomon is not doing. The very one thing that he's not doing is paying attention to God's word. And so we know he's going to have problems living faithfully. We fast forward again to chapter 10, verse 23, and we find this, Thus King Solomon excelled all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. Now, when you read through this by itself, it seems like a positive thing, that Solomon is just the richest person ever. He is so blessed by God. But if you go back and read how the, the king is supposed to live his life, he's not supposed to store up major amounts of wealth. And so Solomon actually is having major problems, even now, even when he's supposedly uh, doing something awesome for God, he's actually doing the exact opposite thing of what he should do, because he didn't put himself in God's word faithfully day after day. And then we move to 1 Kings 11, verse 1, and this is a famous moment. If you, if you have read through this book... And you didn't notice how all the problems that were happening with Solomon before. This is the moment in the book when you begin to see that there are major problems. Right? It says, 1 Kings 11.1 1, King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women from the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the Israelites, You shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for they will surely incline your heart to follow their gods. Solomon clung to these in love. Among his wives were 700 princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. His wives turned away his heart. So we find that Solomon just has major, major problems. Skipping down a few verses, in verse 9 it says, Then the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart had turned away from the Lord, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice, and had commanded him concerning this matter, that he should not follow other gods, but he did not observe that the Lord commanded. Therefore the Lord said to Solomon, Since this has been your mind, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and give it to your servant. But this is a pretty sad moment. And yet what we know from reading Deuteronomy 17, from reading 1 Kings 1-11 through in light of that, is that the reason that Solomon was unfaithful to God is that he did not take the time to spend his time in God's word. And that's just the, the facts of the matter. He didn't know what the commands of the Lord were, and so he made major mistakes. Early in his life, he had a good heart. And it says that he followed after God in all these ways, except for he made a few mistakes. By the time we get to 1 Kings 11, Solomon no longer has a heart after God, but has a heart after the other gods. So this is the problem with Solomon. And what's crazy, as you see, is the rest of First and Second Kings moves on, as things continually get worse. And then you come into Second Kings, and there's this amazing moment where someone is digging around in the temple, and what do they find? They find the law of the Lord. And at that point, the king rips his clothes and has, sends this like time of mourning because they realize that they had been making all of these mistakes and living unfaithfully to God. And then they begin to reform their entire religion around the code and the law of God that Deuteronomy represents. And so this is sort of the story that happens. And what's crazy is that you come to the end of 2 Kings, 
and you find that the people have been taken out uh, into Babylon. They've been ripped away from their own land. Terrible things have happened to them. And it's all because they've been so deeply unfaithful to God. And yet this is what we find in 1 Kings 25, starting at verse 27. In the 37th year of the exile of King Jehoiakim of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, King Evil Merodach of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, released King Jehoiakim of Judah from prison. He spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the other seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim put aside his prison clothes every day of his life. He dined regularly in the king's presence for his allowance. A regular allowance was given him by the king, a portion every day as he long as he lived. So this last little verse is about uh, how God is faithful to Israel and to their king, even when they've been unfaithful to him. The king is in Babylon. He's in exile. He's a prisoner. And yet through God's sovereignty and through his providence, God allows him to sort of have a seat at the Babylonian king's table. And eventually God restores Israel back to the land. And eventually Jesus comes and restores people's hearts. And that's what it is. And yet what's amazing, right, is that still we are called to meditate on God's word. We're still called to be faithful to God by by exploring and spending time studying his word. So even in all the chaos that's going around in our world through the pandemic, it's going around in our country through uh, sort of chaos, political chaos. The question for us is how do we remain faithful to God so that we can know how to live in this crazy world? And the answer is the same as it's always been is to spend our time studying God's word so that we can know how to live for the Lord. Okay, well, uh, I hope that made sense to you. I hope that is a blessing to you. And and I hope that what you'll take away is that you just need to spend time studying God's word, studying God's word and falling in love with his statutes and ordinances for your life. And so that that will guide you even in the difficult days that we live in. All right, well, God bless, and again, look out for more announcements about what exactly church will look like in the coming weeks uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays, Uh, and I hope you all have a wonderful night. Bye.